Hello, today is March 23rd, 2023. I'm Sarah Krafasi from LB3, and this is Staying Connected. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Ben Fox, one of TC2's managing directors, and we're going to talk about negotiating cloud commitments. Everyone in IT is fully aware of the huge growth in the use of cloud services from providers like Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, and Google Cloud Platform, and accordingly, growth in the size of the deals that enterprises enter into with these vendors. One of the primary commercial considerations in these deals is the scope of any commitment that a customer might agree to in return for discounts and other benefits. So today I'm chatting with Ben about what you should be considering when negotiating your enterprise's cloud commitment. Hey, Ben, thanks for joining me to talk about this and welcome back to Staying Connected. Well, hello, Sarah. Nice to talk to you. It's been a little while since I've done one of these. Yeah, we're glad to have you back. So TC2 and LB3 have always spent a lot of time talking at conferences and educating our clients about commitments and telecom deals. But from what you've told me, Ben, it seems like cloud service providers are exactly the same as carriers. Yes, I think that's right, Sarah. I, negotiating these cloud commitments, it really does feel a little bit like negotiating telecom commitments 15 years ago. Back then, we used to see a lot of wacky ideas like commitments that would increase year over year or where the commitment would be the higher of the previous year's commitment and the previous year's spend. I think we used to call those escalator commitments. And now we're seeing all of those same things again, but this time in cloud deals. And then, Sarah, the other parallel with telecom deals from yesteryear that we see is the overriding narrative that the only way to get better discounts and other deal benefits from the CSPs is to enter into a bigger commitment over a longer contract term. And, you know, we spent years educating the telecom buy market that whilst, of course, there is some truth that bigger deals get better pricing, of course they do. It's also absolutely not just about the commitment. And really, it is about your negotiation leverage with the supplier. And then what's interesting now is that, you know, CSPs, they peddle exactly the same themes. You know, woe is me, I can't give you a better discount or I can't give you bigger credits unless you commit more spend to me. But that really is their way of shifting your thinking, the customer's thinking, away from what negotiating leverage you have over the CSP, for example, your ability to use other cloud providers, and trying to make the entire negotiation about what you will commit to them. Mm, So, yeah, that all sounds very familiar to anyone who has done ICT procurements. So what do commitments look like in cloud deals? Well, commitments in cloud deals, they're all about how much money the customer promises to spend over the term of the contract. So we see both contracts with individual annual spend commitments, so a commitment for each year of the contract term. And we also see term commitments where the commitment is a single spend figure that has to be retired over the entire length of the contract and doesn't have any individual annual commitments. And as it happens, we also see deals where there's a term commitment and there's individual annual commitments. And where that happens, normally the annual commitments add up to something a bit lower than the term commitment, but there are both. And of course, there are term commitments are preferable to annual commitments because they offer a bit more flexibility, but they can also be harder to get. And what happens if a customer fails to meet the spend commitment in a cloud deal? So typically, if the customer doesn't meet the spend commitment, doesn't spend enough, then the customer has to pay a one-time charge or a shortfall, if you will, for the difference between the spend and the commitment. However, typically that shortfall payment can then actually be used as a prepayment for the following year, the following contract year with the CSP. So you can apply your shortfall payment against your consumption and spend on cloud services in the following year. I think in telecom, we used to kind of call this a shortfall work-off period. And that's obviously a good thing because ultimately it means the shortfall payment, it's not money for nothing. But it's important to bear in mind that the shortfall payment doesn't retire the following year's commitment. You kind of start behind, if you will. So you can actually end up in shortfall the following year again because you rolled over the spend from the previous year. Well, you rolled over the commitment, I should say, from the previous year. It's also important to make sure that the contract gives you the extra time to consume that shortfall payment. So, for example, if it's a term commitment, the shortfall only occurs right at the end of the contract. You need to make sure that you have the right to add a year to the contract so that you actually have an extra year to consume the shortfall payment if you need to. That's good advice. So what do you see as the biggest risk with cloud spend commitments? So I would say, interesting, that the biggest risk is kind of self-inflicted, really. And what we see is customers committing to overly aggressive growth targets over relatively long contract terms. So the CSPs push this narrative hard that the customer should kind of give everything they can in terms of a big commitment in return for bigger discounts and more credits from the cloud provider. And of course, customers do indeed expect growth in cloud spend. 
But forecasting growth and forecasting the success, if you will, of IT initiatives to increase the adoption and increase the use of cloud services, it's really imperfect science and can be a bit perilous, really. So not least over the three to five year contract terms that the CSPs are pushing for. Yeah, we all know that IT projects often don't run to plan and therefore building your multi-year cloud spend forecast and growth on the assumption that all of those projected initiatives that are expected to increase your cloud spend will actually deliver to plan. You know, that can very easily lead to over committing to your CSP. One of the other contributory problems in this area is that sometimes customers rely on their CSP to generate the cloud spend and the growth forecast. And that's really never a good idea. The CSP definitely has no incentive to moderate the forecast at all, quite the reverse. And the typical outcome is that the CSP presents the customer with a deal based on annual commitments that are equal to 100% of the spend that the CSP forecasts for that customer in each year of the contract. Oh, and we all know that 100% commitments are never a good idea. Exactly. You know, especially based on growth in spend that hasn't happened yet, and indeed might be a few years down the road. And actually, Sarah, you make a really important point that often gets missed. And it's simply that a commitment should not be the same as your best forecast of the spend you expect to have. A buffer between your expected spend and the spend you commit to is really a key component of a cloud commitment construct. But the truth is that the CSPs often equate the forecast and the commitments as the same thing. So our advice and our approach to negotiating cloud commitments is really to firstly take ownership of the forecast of the spend. Do your own calculations of how you expect your spend to grow, if at all, over the course of the desired contract term. You know, the truth is that growth in cloud services is absolutely a reality for many customers. So it's not unreasonable to base commitments on sensible growth figures. And of course, as you know, Sarah, that would be heresy really for a telecom deal. But in cloud deals, it's really just a matter of being suitably conservative. So once you've compiled your conservatively forecast spend, you can take control of the commitment negotiation by presenting to the supplier the percentage of your spend that you're willing to commit to. So for instance, say 70% of the spend forecast over the term of the contract. And it's perfectly reasonable position to present your best guess forecast and then start your negotiation on a commitment with a requirement of a, for example, 30% buffer between the commitment amount and the forecast spend. And how much of a buffer you need depends on attributes such as how much growth you're forecasting, you'd be more aggressive, less aggressive, how much existing spend you already have as a base to kind of rely on. But regardless, there should always be a buffer to accommodate all the potential circumstances that could cause spend to be less than expected and cause growth to be slower or lower than expected. And a buffer should be a key tenet of the commitment negotiation. That's some more great advice. Thanks, Ben. So what else can enterprise customers do to protect themselves from commitment issues? Well, it's definitely worthwhile seeking contractual rights to reduce a commitment in certain circumstances. So especially where the CSP themselves do something that affects your ability to meet the commitment. So, for example, if the CSP adversely changes or discontinues one of the service offerings that you use or changes or removes features and functionalities as as they evolve their products and services, or indeed where the CSP's services suffer outages or, or SLA failures, they're all good things to tie a commitment reduction right to in your contract. It is also good to seek commitment reduction rights to apply in the event you divest part of your business. If you divest 30% of your business, it's good to seek a right to reduce your commitment by 30% because otherwise you'll be in shortfall. But I would say that ultimately, all of these contractual rights, they don't help when your spend ends up simply being lower than you expected. You know, for example, what if you find that you're able to optimize your cloud services and spend? You know, you don't want to be in a commitment hole simply because you optimize. And I would say, Sarah, that as we always say, the best protection for a commitment is simply a lower commitment and a decent buffer. Thanks very much, Ben. It sounds like this will be an area where we will be helping our clients more and more and no doubt discussing this more frequently here on Staying Connected. And if you would like to learn more about cloud deals or you'd like to discuss other ICT needs with Ben or me or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues, please give us a call or shoot us an email. You can also stay current by subscribing to Staying Connected, checking our websites, and following us on LinkedIn.